And thank you. Two different places tonight I want to read from. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 John chapter 2. All right, 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, and uh, then I'll read one, I'm going to read a couple of verses here, then one verse in 1 John chapter 2. Verse 13, but I, would, uh, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we certainly do love you. Lord, we do think of your goodness and your grace, your mercy, your long suffering, your patience with us. And Lord, we want to say thank you. Lord, I pray that you would bless the message tonight in your word. Help me to stay true to your word. Please control what I say and how I say it. I pray, Lord, that it would feed your people. Lord, that it would draw us closer to you. Lord, that we could glorify you in just a a better way with our life. Lord, that too you would meet needs that are here in this room. Help us to be focused on you and and, and just just to go out with a peace of knowing you're in control and what this is all about. Lord, please bless and work. Lord, I do pray for anyone here who is not saved. I, I do pray for their conversion here this evening, Lord. Again, Lord, we love you and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In between services, I had to... I had to run and pick up my camper, and I actually ended up wearing a suit and having to go dump it. So the guy behind me, I start there to do that, and uh, the guy behind me gets out of his camper and, and uh, out of his vehicle. He was towing one as well, and he says, you are absolutely the best dressed man I have ever seen dumping an RV. <laughs> and I laughed, and uh, so I explained to him the situation. I said, I wasn't planning on doing this, and, and I said, this is how this came about, and and, and I said, I pastor a church. And he, says, he said, well, what church do you pastor? And I told him. And, and he, had, he attends a church here in town. And we ended up talking uh, probably more than 20 minutes, standing there talking with him. And, of course, invited him out to church and whatnot. And we got on the subject of the return of Christ. It was already on my mind. I knew I was going to be preaching on that here this evening. And we got talking about that, about all that's taken place from COVID. He was one of the people and. And had a very good, his, his uh, college education and degrees in the medical field. And he had refused to get the vaccine and lo- he was fired over it. Lost his job. Worked 16 years at the same place. And they fired him over that. And, uh, uh, but we were talking about all that's been taking place in this world. Pointing to the return of Jesus Christ. I mean, again, you think about We have just seen so much transpire in, in, in the last few years. I mean, it's just incredible, let alone when you just consider how the world has changed since the 1940s. I mean, every decade, it's just this massive leap now that is taking place. 
even now just recently, just within the past few months. And I'm telling you, that's going to send us a whole nother level. And that's with AI and all that's coming about with that right now. And um, so it's just amazing what we're seeing take place. When I got saved, I actually knew nothing of the rapture. Uh, being Catholic, you did not hear about that. The Catholic Church, church believes in a doctrine called amillennialism. They believe the church is the kingdom. There is no rapture. There is no literal kingdom here on this earth. The church is that kingdom. So I was never taught it. I never heard of it before. Then I get saved, and I was saved for not too long. Several months was the first time. And I remember Pastor John was still there, and he preached a message about this rapture. And I was like, what? What's going to happen? I mean, I had no clue that this was going to take place. And it was really good timing because that week he'd come over to our house just for a visit. And, and it ended up primarily being, and, and I am, what, 12, 13 at the time, just me and him talking. And I was just asking about this thing, the rapture, the second, company, the second coming of Christ, and just clueless that all this was happening. And just fascinated by it. Matter of fact, he was the one who told me, he goes, he goes you need to go get a video called uh, Thief in the Night. Remember that? How many, how many of y'all have seen that? Thief in the Night, Distant Thunder, and all those. So went and got those, I think, that very week and, and watched those. And just amazed that this event would take place. All of a sudden, millions of people who are saved, just gone, just simply disappear. Yet we see that's certainly true in our text, that that day is coming. And as I said, what we have seen take place in this world since World War II has been incredible. I mean, understand, this is like no other time in all, in the 6,000 years of world history. I'm fascinated by, those of you who know in Bible college, I'll teach you a few of the courses. One of those is New Testament history. Really because I'm fascinated about the 400, what we call the silent years between the Testaments, all that God was doing. I find it just incredible where we leave off with the Persian Empire in control and all that the Lord does in preparations for the first coming of the Lord. Uh, from the rise of, of, of the Grecians, Alexander the Great, to the rise of Rome, what that was providing for the world, all of that is all about the gospel and the coming of Christ and things being in place for that gospel to get carried out, the language of the, New Te- language of the New Testament, just incredible. Well, we are seeing much take place right now in preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. After World War II, a significant event occurred, and that was Israel became a nation. Um, May 14th, 1948. Now, again, I, I don't believe I've taught through that in Matthew. I don't believe that is the fig tree for several reasons. I know that's commonly taught. Um, we're beyond those years anyhow. It should, it should go by the wayside, but that's not what that was dealing with. But nonetheless, make no mistake, Israel becoming a nation is enormous when it comes to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's huge. It's taking place. We see it. It's, it's there. I understand, for, 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 that, for the events of Revelation to happen, Israel has to be a nation. They have not been a nation for 2,000 years, and then bam, they're a nation. Incredible. Coming to the end of the 1990s, at the end of the Cold War, what took place, now you saw this mass return to Israel. Um, Amazing. We see, even today, everything that's going on in world events with Russia, um, Ukraine, the, the Russian military, the rise of China. The rise of China has been phenomenal, if you're following that, um, with their, their economic boon allowing them to feed a military that is incredible right now. Um, and see now all this, all this can take place. The world is without a doubt preparing for the Antichrist. The world's getting smaller and smaller. I mean, just we had another major significant event took place in June or July, this month or last month, and that was with the massive switch over to digital currency in place, routing it through the government agency where they could literally stop. They have the ability now to stop you from buying anything as of now that they want to. They wanted to mark you and have your card declined everywhere. That that capability is now in place with how uh, um, transactions are now processed. And that went into law, I think it was in July. It might have been June. Um, I mean, we can see so much happening and preparing for the return of Jesus Christ. Um, the increase in knowledge that the Bible speaks of. 
I mean, really, the, the, how, how we have jumped in our knowledge and our understanding of sciences is fascinating, just incredible. The increase in sin, the calling good evil and evil good, I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, the Bible talks about this for time's sake, I'm not going to turn there, but in 2 Timothy chapter 3, how in the last days, general apostasy would take place. Man, we're seeing that. I mean, I mean, think, we, we can see it in two major areas right now that are clear as a bell. There's no ambiguity. It's, it's just clear. It's evidence. It's, it's, it's what we're seeing take place. We're seeing uh, 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 the acceptance of sin as normal life from homosexuality and, and uh, I mean, this transgender thing is wow. I mean, the people are buying this and believing it. It's just incredible. Just amazing. This, this mass rebellion towards God. We're seeing the apostasy take place in how, for the most part, as I'm sure all of us recognize now, this is not a mainstream church. No, by, by no means. I mean, what that looks like nowadays is amazing. I mean, it's, it's so worldly, so filled with carnality, all in the name of praise and worship and and incredible. James chapter 5 speaks of the last days will be a time of great wealth. I let Levi know. Levi got a, a, a raise at work. And uh, why are they giving that? I don't know why they would do that. They gave him a raise at work, but they did. And so with the raise that he got, I let Levi know. And this is a true statistic. I said, Levi, with this raise, you have now entered into the top 1% of income in the world. Think about that. Doesn't take much. If you're over 32000 a year, you're in the top 1% of income in the world. <clears throat> so let me ask you this question. I don't know when the return is. I don't. It could be a thousand years. I don't know when. I don't know when the Lord's going to return. But again, with everything we're seeing take place, I will be surprised if we're not the generation that sees the return of Christ. So, let's suppose that we know that the Lord is coming the end of August. We know it. Just just for sake of the sermon here. That. That knowledge is given, and we know that on August 30th, the return of the Lord is going to take place. I mean, just bear with me. Say, say that was true, and we knew it. How would you live differently? How would that knowledge affect your life? Some might say, I'm going to go max out my credit cards right now. I'm going to go, one, you need to get saved. Okay, that's your indicator. The red flag hit. <laughs> if that's where your mind went, <laughs> you, you really need to examine whether you be in the faith. And I'm, I'm not really joking with that. Um, but how differently would you live your life? You see, because you're going to be found in one of two ways. Either in confidence or ashamed. And understand, when that moment hits, so much of what you thought that really mattered, you're going to see doesn't. It doesn't. At that moment, you will realize what I say almost every time behind this pulpit. All that matters is God. It's what it's all about. And at that moment, when you see him in his power and his majesty, and, and that the realization sets in, even though you put your faith in it, we walk by faith right now. Faith will be gone. It will be sight. That changes things. So at that moment that your faith is made sight, oh, will it hit. He was all that mattered. Followed by the thought, what have I done? What have I done for him? Realizing the creator himself died for you. How different would you live? How would you adjust? If we knew August 30th, the Lord is going to return. 
how would you live differently? I was asked this. I want to cover it briefly as I go into this, into this message. I, I, I got a text from uh, one of our members asking me about the rapture again and timing of it and was being questioned about it. Um, and let me cover this very quickly. If you're not certain of this, I would get ready to make some notes on this portion of the message before I come back to whether you're confident or you're ashamed. I do want to cover very quickly why we are pre-trib, why we are pre-trib. And what I mean by that is we believe that that rapture takes place before the seven-year tribulation time frame begins. We know the exact amount of years from what the Bible teaches on it. That's clear as a bell. We believe the rapture happens at the very start of that is when the Lord will come and pull all Christians out. And there is somewhat of a, of a debate on it. You have those who believe it won't happen till three and a half years in. Some are what we call pre-wrath. And then there is post. Now, the mid and pre-wrathers, it's pretty similar. Um, and then post is after it's over. Um, so I, I want to cover that just briefly, very quickly. Um, we see in 1 Thessalonians, I'm not going to read it again, is the promise of the rapture taking a place, this event where God snatches out, where God removes all believers I- I- rapidly. In the twinkling of an eye, all saved people will be removed from the earth in one event. Again, 1 Corinthians 15 also speaks more to the speed of it, how rapid this will hit the earth. By the way, you can, you can see another thing taken up for it. it. It just hit my mind, all this talk recently about all the UFO stuff. I mean, it's just so setting up for this stuff. Just amazing. So when does this take place on God's prophetic timetable? Again, mid-tribbers, they say real wrath does not begin until those vials hit. This is, I'm, I'll cover pre-wrath and mid-trib at the exact same time. And on one level, they're right. Major wrath does not hit. When those, you got, if you remember, I went through the book of Revelation. I don't have time to do it now. But you, you start off with seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. All right? Three sets of judgment that will hit the earth in that seven-year time frame. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials in that order. Seals, trumpets, vials. And, it, and as it goes on, it progresses worse and worse. So the time you get to those last seven, they are massive wrath hitting the earth. Okay, So that's where they like to place the rapture, and so they use different events to try and support it. But they're easily debunked. Um, they say that the, the, the removing of the two witnesses, if you remember the witnesses will be killed that God has, uh, we don't know exactly who they are. Again, we, we discussed that in Revelation, Moses and Elijah, whoever it might be, Elijah and uh, um, Zerubbabel is actually one thought. And there's there several different um, ideas up there and reasons why people believe it. It really doesn't matter. It'll be two witnesses that God does have, and they're going to be slain, but then God's going to raise them up, and they're taken up. And they say, that's there. There's your rapture right there. And they take that because that's at the conclusion of the seven trumpets. So they like to say, they make the connection, with that seventh trumpet and at the last trump, all right? That is, both those are enormous stretches and don't fit it. Let me, let me cover why very quickly. One, we know from, uh, you get into Revelation chapter 6, when the seals hit, the Bible describes it as wrath. So wrath is already hitting with the seals, so we have to be gone before wrath. All right, so that's, that debunks it alone. But let's deal with this Trump thing. That's just a weak connection. The Bible does not connect those two at all. When you're dealing with this idea of, uh, of last of something, there's something that's either last in time or last in sequence. All right? Clearly, what we're seeing in Revelation 7 it, it, it is dealing with something last in sequence because you have the first trump, the second trump, the third trump, the fourth trump, the fifth trump, the sixth trump, and then the seventh trump, which is the last of those seven trumpets. It's not the last of the trump for all time. It's just simply the last of that. That's what it teaches. Okay? Um, and it cannot be mid-trib. It cannot be pre pre-wrath in that sense because we have wrath hitting with the seals now remember the seals are interesting with what god allows man to begin causing the wrath basically until the sixth seal is open so you have you 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 have the 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 rise of war leading to famine leading to death all those are different seals that god's going to unleash and then of course everything the world's wondering this world is just falling apart but they don't see why until the sixth seal is open 
Many of you remember what happened at the sixth seal? The enormous earthquake. At that time, it's the biggest earthquake the world have ever seen. The entire world will be shaking. Now, what the world doesn't realize at that point is there's even a bigger one coming at the very end. There's even a bigger one coming in that one at the very end. But up to that point in world history, that will be the first earthquake of, that shakes the entire world. And it's not really to cause death. That's not why God does it. It's at that moment, that Revelation 16, when that sixth seal hits, that all the world realizes, oh no, everything that's happening is from the Creator. It's from the Creator. If you read in Revelation, it says, everyone will know what's happening is from God. Okay? Um, so anyhow, it cannot be mid-trib for those, uh, for those reasons. And then you would also see that post-trib, several of the reasons I just gave fit the exact same thing. They like to argue that the, the biggest argument for post-trib is this. They like to say the, the theological teaching of pre-trib did not really start until the 20th century, the 19th and 20th century. Um, now, there's some truth to that, but that doesn't mean it's not true. They're arguing from silence, not from Scripture. So, so let's cover that aspect very quickly right now. Um, now, if you go way back into the into, uh, first, second, third century, no, you do see writings dealing, lining up with exactly what we believe, a pre-trib rapture. But then it does go into a time of silence. But why? What took place? You had the rise of the Catholic Church, the rise of Augustine's writings. And so, uh, 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 for, for the most part, those who are educated, those who are writing, they held to a belief called amillennialism, which, which, and postmillennialism, which by the eight, 19th century, people believe that's just impossible. Uh, and amillennial, but the church was the kingdom. The Catholic church was in control. That's what they taught. There is no rapture. And there were other theological issues that were being debated besides eschatology, such as saved by faith or by works. What role does the church play or doesn't play? And all those issues were getting, were getting argued out. That was where your apologetics were. That's where the arguments were, dealing with things like salvation. Once that got straightened out, now people did turn their attention to eschatology. And that's where it got more cemented in a pre-tribulation rapture. But nonetheless, the fact that that's your only argument, it's, it's, it's an argument of silence. It bears no weight. The, the, the thing is, what does the scriptures teach? And so, anyhow, um, it, that certainly does not hold any water. And you can apply the same arguments from mid-trib to that one. We have to be out of here before wrath. God has always delivered his people from wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. God chastises his people. He does not put us under wrath. Besides the fact, another huge, let me, let me throw this one in here. I can throw it to both, but especially post-millennialism, it fits. It removes any possibility of an imminent return of Christ. Completely. Gone. Can't happen. If post-trib is, is true, there's no possibility of an imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only one that makes that true is pre-trib. Okay? So pre-trib. Um, here's some verses not going to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. We are not appointed to wrath. Um, Revelation 3.10, we will deliver from the hour of temptation. We see wrath begins with the seals. Revelation chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, you have wrath hitting. Believers must be gone um, before those seals are open. We have to be gone. It is the, number two, it's the only view that allows for an imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've already covered that. Um, and, and, there, and think of that. You say, well, does the Bible teach it? Yes. Over and over it stretches. Be ready. For I come in an hour when you know not. Uh, the Lord taught, it's taught throughout, the imminent return. The only way that is possible is with a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? Um, the removal before wrath I've covered. Oh, yes. Uh, one thing that I love, and I, I got more grounded in that when we went through the book of Revelation. The 24 elders before the throne. I find that fascinating. Who are they? Because it's, it's, it's unique. So, all right, so you got John who, he's taken out. It's gone. So you finish up four, you get into chapter five, you've got these 24 elders around the throne. Anyhow, what, what I've come to the conclusion, you can't be too dogmatic on this, but when I studied that, I'm like, that is that. That is representation of the rapture of those who've been taken out before the throne of God. Uh, but that's a whole nother sermon. I have a whole sermon on that. You can go back and listen to that, why I believe that. 
Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the remainder of the removal of the restrainer. Again, you can go into 2 Thessalonians uh, series, and I talk about that, the indwelling Holy Spirit that we have within us. And another huge one. You come to the end of Revelation chapter 3. The first three chapters all deal with local churches. Church at Ephesus, church at Sardis, church at Philadelphia, Thyatira, um, um, Smyrna. So it's dealing with churches. All of a sudden, you have this event that takes place in John chapter 4 and verse 1 where John is taken up to heaven. Boom, gone. Doors open, boom. I believe that does picture the rapture of the church myself because at that point, the church is gone. Not there. It's been everything about churches. That event happens, gone. Not mentioned again to the very end of the book. What happened to it? It's not there. The rapture's taken place. <clears throat> um, and again, so that's, that's in And by the way, John's vision ties in with Ezekiel chapter 1. There's more support for that that you can find biblically and not just one isolated text. Uh, let's see. Um, let me get back to the thrust of the message. I think that's good enough to cover as far as pre, mid, and post-trib. So when the rapture does happen, I mean, it's going to be incredible. Uh, I mean, at this time, you have a reunion of, of this corruptible body that shall put on incorruption takes place. God will raise it from the dead and change it. The, the reuniting, if you will, of that soul and spirit with that body that is now changed. And just incredible what God is going to do. Um, and, uh, I mean, look at first. John. I'm already in First John. I'll, I'll read it. I'm in chapter 3. Let me read a verse here. Verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So when the Lord does return, I mean, if it's August 30th, let's say. At August 30th, this corruption will put on incorruption into this perfect, incredible body. Glasses gone. Perfect health. The, the, the limitations we have now will be greatly removed from us. At the, I, I mean, no sickness. Uh, I mean, no death. There's the, 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 the consequences of sin are completely removed. So aging is done. Aging is a result of sin. Aging is over with. That ends, and we're in this perfect body. That will just be incredible. I mean, to have that. Amazing. And I, I don't know what all we get to do up there. Where's, uh, is Brother Shane here right now? Is he here? Is he out in back there? Uh, he's ushering out there. See, then I'm hoping the Lord allows us to do something like that, that I can get my own F-22 and dogfight with him. And I'm really good on a computer. I think I can beat him is what I think. Now. But just to smash it into a mountain, I'm not going to die. Let's go Mach 5 and hit that mountain. <laughs> Steve, you really need a new body. I mean, if anybody in here is going to be glad for the rapture to happen this month, it's Steve Brunk. <laughs> but back to the question I have. How will you be found if it happens? You're going to have that new body, but understand, you're going to stand before God Almighty. You're going to be in his presence. And it's going to be this, you know, I'd seen this clip that there's going to be, or a sermon, I'm sorry, not a clip, a sermon that I had listened to of the seven types of Christians when they meet the Lord. And really, uh, there was hardly anyone I could follow. It discounts completely the message how we're going to view Christ in reality. Don't worry, the Lord loves me more than anyone. I don't question that. He is my, as, as I'm even address God as my father, what a privilege. We looked at that Wednesday night when talking about prayer. But make no mistake about it. When I get to heaven, that is the creator God almighty. It's not going to be my best friend. This is the almighty God who spoke this world into existence. And we get a glimpse of that 
between John, who used to lay his head on his bosom when Christ was on earth, and when John sees him again in Revelation chapter 1. A little bit different response there. That's the response we're going to be seeing. And it's going to be complete awe. It's going to be oh, bowing down. My Lord and my God. But as we see in 1 John chapter 2, there will be a number of us that when he does return, we will be ashamed. Why? Number one, because of sin. Because of sin. Of refusing to deal with a measure of sin that when he comes, that return hits, that trump sounds, and you see him. Oh, you're still saved. You're still saved. That, that justice part of that was taken care of at the cross. But you just entered eternity. Do you understand that? You entered eternity. Another reason why you might be found ashamed is because you're, and this is sin too, but it's more specific, directed. You're out of the will of God. You chose your own way. He saved you. You have been bought with a price. You know it. You've heard the preaching, but you said, I just want to do what I want to do. And then it's just going to hit at that moment. What, what was I thinking? Doing what I want to do in this sinful flesh? I mean, this is the creator, the one who saved me, who created me. I mean, made all this possible for me. And I decide I'm going to do what I want to do. Out of the will of God. Another group that will be ashamed. Now listen. This is taken from a lesson even of the Lord Jesus Christ. So concerned with the cares of this world. Anxiety, fretting, worrying. When he says, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Knowing that you can go right to the Lord with all of these things and trust him. Some... When the Lord comes, and this is the group you want to be in, you want to be confident. You want to be confident. It means they're ready, as the Lord commanded. Be ready. Be ready. I mean, they're still going to be falling on their face. We're not talking about a confidence. Yeah, Lord, you're glad you had me on your team. I did well, didn't I? That's not what we're talking about at all. It's just you knew you humbly followed God. You wanted his will. You just simply wanted to honor him with the knowledge you have where you're at. Lord, I just wanted to glorify you. And the Lord knows that better than you. Exactly where you're at. I remember when uh, uh, I was at my cousin's. We were, I don't know, 14 or whatever. And we decided to use the living room. as The, the parent, my aunt and uncle were not home. We decided to use the living room as our wrestling room. We had another room he sort of designated for that. It was a huge wrestling family, but we, we used the living room. And we got full around way too much with it with wrestling. And I don't remember who. One of us put the other one through the wall. The living room wall. Boom. I mean, a whole bot. Boom. Gone. I mean, we're not talking a little hole in all. We're talking kink. And at my time, I have no construction. I, I thought we just ruined the house. And went through the wall. Needless to say, all of us were petrified. I mean, there's no way of covering this up. You can't hide it behind the couch. You can't move a chair. You can't move a lamp. There's no hiding it. So when the car pulled in, they were in the Chevette or the LTD. I can't remember which one. All of us were in the living room. Not a one of us had any confidence. We knew what was going to happen when he walked in and saw the massive hole in his living room wall. Why? We were disobedient, and he came home. And what we did, there was no covering it up. When the Lord returns, listen, there's no covering it up. None. When you, when you look at him with those eyes, flames of fire, and they're going, just like John experienced when he dropped, they're going right through you. There's no covering it up.
Now, as I said, as I come to a finish, we will all be amazed. We're entering into a perfect world. And really, I can't wait. I mean, just to get out of this sin-cursed earth, this sin-cursed body, to enter in this perfect world. I remember, the th- I mean, I've always thought about that, but I, I just remember it sticks in my mind when Russell Way got saved in New Guinea. He was the fellow that I, I thought was saved, and, and he had ne- was never able to attend because he was, he was sick and didn't know what was wrong with him. I'd take him every week to get, to get uh, his medication. And then the, the one day I went to visit with him, I actually went up there to talk with his adult children that he wanted to see saved. And uh, that was when I left there, and as I was leaving there, the conviction hit to go back and witness to him, because I never heard his testimony. I thought he was saved. I was told he was. He used to be a member there in, in the Baptist church, and, and, uh, um, and so I went back in, and I said, and I asked him to tell me when he got saved, and I listened to his testimony, and it was no salvation works. I was like, oh. No, no, no. And that, that fellow, I got on my knees and I, and I said, uh, and I told Russ, so I pleaded with him. I said, I need you to listen to me right now. Right now, you got to listen to everything I'm telling you because what you just told me, you're not saved. I want you to listen to me. Went through the gospel. At the end, he's, he's crying, weeping, and he puts his faith in Christ right there. Just great. I was so excited. The next day was Saturdays was my visit day. Sunday, as soon as the service ended, and so on, I went to go see Russ away again. I get there and and keep in mind, this is, I've been there for a couple of years. His condition had not changed one time. I didn't, even the day before, he was just fine. His wife met me outside the houseboy where he was, he was, that's where he had been staying. And she had said, at first she told me, don't even go in there. She told me, um, I mean, means he, he's lost his mind. And so I said, I, I want to go in. And so she, then she let me in. I step inside. His back was turned. He was conscious, but completely out of his mind. He could not understand anything I was saying, nothing. Think about this. It was, was what, 12, 14 hours earlier? Little did I know that in less than 18 hours, he would be incapable of understanding the gospel. And then that Tuesday they came to me, he had died. He had passed away, went to be with the Lord. But here's a guy that was on this island in Ireland, bush, bush living all his life, never had a refrigerator, never had a bathroom, never had an outhouse. Never plugged in one item, never flipped on a switch for a light, never happened one time. And I remember thinking when I, 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 up there, I was at his, doing his funeral, and the whole village is there, and they got his body there, of course, and thinking, man, he went from this to heaven. I mean, want to talk about shock and awe. I mean, Wow. So it will be so amazing when it does take place. But listen, we want to be found, finish up with two things real quick, standing fast and proclaiming the gospel. Standing fast, don't quit. Stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful, don't quit. Stay faithful. It's about God. It's not about our trials here and our troubles here and all that we're going through right now. Stay focused on God, don't quit quit. He's what it's about. And then I, I want to stress the proclaiming of the gospel because just think if you're your own neighbor and lost, if you have none of this knowledge, would you not want somebody to tell you? You say, but they won't listen. Listen, leave that up to the Lord. You have no idea who's going to listen and who's not. You have no idea if your neighbor's been praying for three weeks God, I know you're there. Please, show me. You just don't know. You want to be found as somebody who's proclaiming the gospel. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Now, perhaps you're here. I don't think we have any first-time visitors here right now, but perhaps you're here. You're not certain that you have been converted. You don't know that heaven is your home. You don't know if the rapture happens, if you're gone or you're staying. Say, Pastor, please pray for me. I don't know that I am saved. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Please pray for me. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Again, I do see some small children. All right, Christian. There's so much happening in this world. Listen. Don't quit. We sing the song, and it's so true. It will be worth it all 
when we see Christ. Stay focused on him. Not on the trials and the struggles. Stay focused on him. Don't quit. You want to be found not ashamed, but confident. If the Lord dealt with your heart, you come and pray. Father in heaven, bless this invitation, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Page 160. And if you need to come and pray, you come and pray. 160.